Before you start studying metabolism, you have to start by having a good way of understanding energy. And that's because photosynthesis, cellular respiration, the whole point of those processes is to build up or break down molecules that store energy. Now, energy is a really difficult thing to um, understand and to explain because there's not any one physical basis for energy. You know, charge, there's a physical basis for. Um, you just count how many unbalanced electrons or protons there are, and uh, you can calculate the charge. But energy, energy is much more abstract and tricky. So I think that the best way to get at energy is to, uh, is to use an example. Now, I know a lot of people use the example of a boulder or a bicycle or something that's on top of a hill to explain energy. And we're going to use a different example. We're going to use the example of a mattress spring. So um, by a spring, I mean a helix of wire that, uh, that in this case is difficult to press together, to compress. So um, the way we're going to represent this is that we have two states, an, uh, an uncompressed state and a compressed state. And we have the transitions from one state to the other. So this transition, this reaction, is the process where I come along and, I don't know, I lie on top of the mattress or I, I put my hands on the ends of the mattress and sort of squeeze together so that um, I get this. Uh, and of course this is the other transition. And this transition, um, I don't really have to do anything. Um, I just get off the bed or I let my hands apart and this compressed spring will spring back and give me back the uncompressed spring. So a couple things to think about when we think about the, uh, this spring. And one is sort of what I was just talking about, which is that one of these reactions or one of these transitions is spontaneous and the other one is not. Um, and you know, by spontaneous, I mean uh, that one of the reactions would take place all by itself. So which of these reactions, from uncompressed to compressed or compressed to uncompressed, which of those reactions is spontaneous? Um, so. The one that's spontaneous, of course, is this one, the, the one where I just get off the bed. Um, it, it would happen all by itself. Uh, if I were to take a spring like this in its uncompressed state and leave the room and come back uh, an hour later, it would still look like this. It wouldn't spontaneously compress itself. Whereas if I took a spring that was in this state and left the room and came back just a half a second later, it would look like this. It would spring back. It would revert to this uncompressed state. So the other way of thinking about this um, issue of whether a reaction is spontaneous or not is to think about whether the state is stable or not. So this uncompressed state, uh, this state that would stay this way for hours or weeks or however long I, I, I care to wait, this is the stable state. And this compressed state, in this case, is the unstable state. So the reaction that takes you from the unstable to the stable, that's the spontaneous reaction. The, those two things sort of mean the same thing. This is unstable, meaning that it will engage in um, a reaction. Uh, this one is stable, meaning that it won't. So I'm just going to write that this is spontaneous. And I'm going to write that this one is, I don't know, say not the other thing to think about when we think about these spring states is something that I sort of alluded to earlier, which is that this reaction, not only is it not spontaneous, but it's kind of difficult. You know, it takes some strength on my part, or it takes me climbing onto the bed. So I'm going to describe that as that this reaction requires an input of energy. Um, and uh, the fancy word for that is that this is an endergonic reaction. The erg meaning energy and end meaning in. Um, and this reaction, you might guess, is the opposite. It results in an output of energy. And we call that an exergonic reaction. Exergonic. All right, so I know, I'm supposedly explaining energy, but I'm also just talking about energy as part of the explanation. You know, talk about an input of energy or an output of energy. What do I mean by all that? Well, here's where I explain energy by giving you the best business idea you'll ever hear. Okay, so get your pencils ready. Here goes. 
you sell compressed springs. You spend all night in your basement compressing mattress springs. You know, you buy a bunch of springs for, I don't know, who knows, a dollar a piece. That's probably too much. I haven't done the research. So you buy a bunch of springs and you just spend all night just kind of sitting on them or pressing them together with your hands or rolling something heavy on Whatever you do, you compress these springs and every time you compress a spring, you put a strap around it so that it stays compressed. So at the end of the night, you've got 50 or 100 of these compressed springs and you go up out and you sit on the sidewalk and you sell these things for, I don't know, $5 per compressed spring. I haven't done the research. You can do the pricing research yourself. But people will buy these compressed springs because they're useful. So this is the key. Why are they useful? Well, imagine somebody is doing a demolition project in her house and she needs to take down a wall. She might buy one of these springs. So she takes the spring, puts it up against that wall, cuts the strap, and bam! It knocks a hole in the wall. Maybe somebody wants to get rid of something, you know, disgusting. So he found a cockroach in his basement and he wants to get rid of it. He buys one of your compressed springs, puts it on the ground, and, I don't know, sets it at a little bit of an angle, puts the cockroach on it, cuts the strap, and boom! The cockroach flies away. Um, so, what are people buying when they buy these compressed springs? Are they buying the spring? Well, okay, yes. Of course they're buying the spring, but they're paying $5. What's that extra $4 for? What they're buying is the energy that you stored in that spring the night before. A spring is a storage is an energy storage device. The um, the energy that you put into it, you know, your muscle energy that you use to compress the spring and to put it into that unstable compressed state. That en the energy that you put into it is stored and when they cut the strap the same, amount of the same amount of energy that you stored in it is going to be released and turned into um, the mechanical and sound energy of breaking a wall or the, the kinetic energy of the cockroach being flung across a field. Energy takes a lot of different forms. That's why it's difficult to think about. But uh, when we talk about metabolism or any of these biological processes, it's really just about energy being transformed from one form into another form, being stored, being re-released, and that's, that's how we're going to understand these biochemical energy systems. Okay, so the spring has a stable state and an unstable state. The stable state we're going to think of as being the low energy state. Stable is low energy, whereas the unstable compressed state we're going to think of as the high the high energy state. Now, the chemicals that we talk about, the, the energy storage molecules that we talk about when we talk about metabolism work the same way. Uh, the main one is ADP, ATP, right? Uh, ADP, which is uh, which is uh, adenosine diphosphate, and ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate, right? Di meaning that this has two phosphates, and tri meaning that it has three phosphates. And the reason that this is important is that this is what makes the ATP more unstable than the ADP. These phosphate groups are, they're, they're, they're big, um, they have charge on them, they repel each other. So the three phosphate groups in ATP don't like being together. Um, given a chance, the ATP would gladly revert. Oh, you can't see the arrow, I just drew. Would gladly revert to the ADP. So, so, so this reaction is spontaneous. If you have a bucket of ATP in solution and you walk away for a while and you come back, a lot of it will be ADP. Um, I don't actually know the kinetics of that, so I'm not going to say any numbers or anything, but um, this is the, ender the exergonic reaction. Um, it's the reaction that takes us from the unstable state to the stable state. This is the, the spontaneous reaction. Whereas this reaction, taking us from ADP to ATP, this is the difficult one because it means that you have to take a phosphate group and sort of stick it on there where, where, where it doesn't want to be. Um, so this reaction requires an input of energy. As, as we talk about uh, metabolism, we're going to see a lot of these, these pairs between states of molecules. You know, like the most famous one is going to be, you know, ADP and ATP. But 
Well, you know, you'll also hear, see a lot of stuff that involves NAD or NAD plus and NADH, um, where NADH is high energy. You know, I'm gonna put little shininesses around the high energy ones. Um, and NAD is the low energy state. Um, FAD and FADH2. And uh, when we talk about photosynthesis, uh, there'll be NADP and NADPH. And sort of in general, um, if you look at uh, photosynthesis or respiration um, as a whole, in general, we're talking about reactions that take us between um, molecules that have a lot of high energy carbon-carbon bonds. Um, so carbon-carbon bonds are difficult to make. They require energy to create these bonds. Um, and when we break them, that energy is released. And when we break them, we're often forming uh, carbon dioxide. So in photosynthesis, we have an input of energy from light, and that takes that, that lets the plant take carbon dioxide and shove those carbons together into these energy-rich carbon-carbon bonds. And when cells do cellular respiration, they're breaking down those carbon-carbon bonds, and that energy is released, and that energy is used to drive the reaction of taking ADP and shoving an extra phosphate onto it, an inorganic phosphate, to form ATP. So this is, so this is going to be this common motif when we study metabolism, is that you've got an endergonic reaction that's being driven by an exergonic reaction, um, but that exergonic reaction has to be set up by some earlier endergonic reaction. So it's just a series of endergonic and exergonic reactions sort of chained together and energy uh, transitioning between different forms um, every step along the way.